And so I don't know about y'all, but for me, one of the worst feelings, one of the wing things I just don't like enduring through is when you know you're like you're in debt to something. Whether it can honestly be to something, to someone, to an organization, to a school, to whatever it is, it just, it's not a fun feeling to have. Like, I don't know if y'all remember, a couple weeks back, I made that joke from The Office where we had Andy Bernard, and he, can, he didn't like being indebted to people. He had to pay back the debt immediately. And I, I get that, but I don't go to quite that extreme, but I get that feeling of just like, I don't want to owe something unless I have to owe something. And it's just such a good feeling when you know that like, you made that payment, you know it's been paid in full, you're good to go. It's just such a nice feeling to have. And if you talk to any good financial advisor, student advisor, whatever it may be, they'll always tell you that one of the top priorities you should have is paying off your debts, is, is trying to clear out all the things that you may owe. So whether that be credit cards, whether that be car loans, school loans, your mortgage, whatever it is, they say paying off your debt should be one of the top priorities for you to get financial freedom. But what's nice is when the world's advice of, of talking about being debt-free happens to coincide with what the Bible teaches of advocating for us to be debt-free, because that's what the Bible has taught us from the very beginning. But what the Bible does tell us to do is that we are still to owe something. We are to be in debt specifically to love. That no matter how much love we may give, no matter how much we love other people, no matter how much we think we may love our spouses, our families, whoever it is well, we're still called to be in debt to love always. And so again, we are continuing in our series here talking of the gospel shift, of seeing how the gospel shifts everything of our perspective, how everything changes because of how the gospel has changed us. And we started this back in chapter 12, where Paul told us again that we are to be living sacrifices, right? That because of what Christ did on the cross, of how he died for each and every one of us, because of that action, we should now live as sacrifices, glorifying him in everything that we do. And since that statement back then, what Paul's been covering for us is, again, practical ways that we can be a living sacrifice. Like last week, we looked at, like, how are we to be a living sacrifice in the context of, like, the government, right? Then when we look at us as citizens of, in our particular context, the U.S., but really of any government, being a citizen under that government, how are we to glorify God as being part of the government, and now Paul shifts and he tells us, so not only are we to be living sacrifices in our respects to the government, but we're to be living sacrifices to one another, to our neighbors, to our friends, to our families, to the people around us. So what does it mean for us to be a living sacrifice to our neighbors? And so if you have your devices, if you have your Bibles, you can turn. We're going to be in Romans chapter 13. We're going to finish the chapter. We're going to start in verse 8. We're going to go all the way down to 14. So Romans chapter 13, verse 8. And this reads for us here, Oh, no one anything except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. I think in these first three things, the first thing that Paul drives us towards and the first thing he teaches is that very phrase at the end, that love is the law, right? That loving others and, and continuing to show love to our neighbors is showing the law. These are one and the same. And we can see that, again, if we break it down from verse 8 here, Paul says that we are to know, 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 know nothing except to love one another. This goes back to kind of what I was starting with, that of all the debts we're supposed to have, we're supposed to pay all of them off except you're going to continuously be in debt to love. And then we should do our best, again, to be debt-free as much as possible, but you're never going to pay off the debt of love in, in totality. And the reason we do that is because loving others is fulfilling the law. Right? Paul elaborates on this idea in verse 9. He says, and he gives out these different commandments. He talks about that you shouldn't commit adultery, that you shouldn't murder, you shouldn't steal, or covet, and so forth. And again, you can see, like, doing these things is not loving your neighbor. Like, if you are committing adultery, you, well, perhaps you're loving too much is maybe the way I should phrase it. But again, you're not loving your brother, your sister, if you're sleeping with their spouse. You're, if you're murdering somebody, you're not loving on them by taking their life. If you're stealing from them, you're not loving on them because you're taking something that belongs to them. And a lot of people argue about the covenant because covenant is in your heart. Like, what, what does it, how does that affect them if I care what they want? <clears throat> But coveting, I think, again, it starts on the inside. It's your desire for what they have, and even to the point where you don't want them to have it. It's taking something that doesn't belong to you and desiring it so much that you would be happier if they weren't happy too. 
Not only that, again, coveting, I think, also spawns the rest of them. It's desiring somebody's wife that leads you to adultery. It's desiring somebody to, to, to not live, that you don't want them to be here, that they bother you that much. It's desiring what they have, that you want to take it. Coveting, I think, is the spawn of a lot of these things. But ultimately, again, it's not about any individual commandment that we look at here. And you can see how Paul phrases it at the end. He says, these are the ones that he's listed, but he says, and any other commandment after that. All of these are summed up in this one command, that you love your neighbor. And he, he continues in verse 10, and he tells us that love does nothing wrong. Right? That if you love your neighbor well, you do no wrong to your neighbor. That when you obey the law that God has given us, that you are called to follow, that you won't harm your neighbor, but instead you'll love your neighbor. That's what it means for us to love the law. But the natural question that I think that spawns from here then is, well, who is my neighbor then? Like, who is supposed to be my neighbor? If I'm to love my neighbor, who is my neighbor? And I think that's, that's the very question we get from one of the lawyers testing Jesus. When he was having this discussion, this, this person, this lawyer came to Jesus and he said, well, how do I gain eternal life? What is the greatest commandment? What am I supposed to do? And Jesus told him, you are to love God and you are to love your neighbor. And I'm paraphrasing and cutting this down. But he tells him these two things. And the follow-up question that the lawyer has says, well, I know how to love God, but how do I love my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And again, I think that's a fair question, right? If you're told, well, you need to do these two things to gain eternal life, and you're like, well, I know how to do this one. Well, tell me, tell me how to do this one. That's, that's a fair question. And I know God tells us, again, he tells us that we are to love our neighbor. But again, if I'm to gain eternal life, then you need to tell me, like, who is my neighbor? And for me, I don't know, when I think of neighbor, the very first thing that comes to mind is actually Mr. Rogers. Like, any time I think of neighbor, that's, that's just where my, my head goes. And I think, thankfully, because of the movie and the documentary that came out a couple years ago, more of you probably know who he is, or at least know that at the beginning of every, uh, every episode, he started off by singing, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Like he wrote not only the words, but the music to this song, and he believed every single word of it. He wanted to have a relationship with everybody. He thought everyone was special, and everyone was worthy of being his neighbor. He always wanted to spend time caring for them, getting to know them, and just growing in a relationship with them. There's a story even of when Mr. Rogers was being driven to a super important dinner. He was invited by a person. The person sent a limo to go pick up Mr. Rogers. And when they arrived on the spot, he had been talking with his driver this entire time. And he found out, like, hey, like, what are you going to do while I'm in dinner? And he was like, well, I'm just going to sit in my car for the next two hours because that's the duration of the dinner. And Mr. Rogers was like, no, no, no. Like, you're going to come and you're going to join us for dinner. You're not going to sit here for two hours. You're going to join us for this dinner. Then afterwards, they're heading back home. And instead of sitting in the back like you traditionally do, Mr. Rogers sits in the front. He sits shotgun next to the driver. And he continues having conversations and getting to know this man. And he finds out as they're driving on the way to the airport, they're going to pass the driver's house. And so he says, we should stop and meet your family. And so he stops and he meets them and he plays music for them and he sings with them and he has life with them. And they said that this was probably the highlight of not only their week, month, but probably their lives. This was just an amazing time that they could have with this one gentleman who this person was only responsible for her driving from point A to point B. Mr. Rogers, again, I don't know how many of you know, he's actually an ordained minister and he lived by the mantra, love others and love yourself. And I think, again, this is just the perfect example of how we can imbue what Christ has called us to. I think Mr. Rogers did that perhaps better than many of us can. And hopefully we can, we can achieve towards that. But ultimately, we're striving for what Christ has called us to. Right? That we are to exemplify what it means for us to love God and to love our neighbors. And so that's what we've been called to today. That's what Paul is leading us here towards. That when we love others well, we follow the law. And when we remind ourselves that everyone is our neighbor, we are called to love everyone. And so Paul continues into his next point here in verses 11 and 12. And he says, Besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Our salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. I think in looking through this, the second thing that we see from what Paul teaches us here is that the time is now, right? That, that we should love our neighbors, that we are called to love our neighbors, and we're called to do so today. It's not about putting it off till tomorrow. It's not till, well, I'll make, I, have, I have more time next week, and it just makes more sense for me. No, we're called to love now. 
And in verse 11 here, Paul says that this besides this is what he starts with. And this besides this is really talking about everything from verse 12 all the way to over here. But he's kind of putting a particular focus, again, on what he's just brought into just now. He talks that since we are to live as sacrifices and we're to love those around us genuinely because of that, and that we know that loving people is the law, we need to recognize that, again, the time to do that is right now. That you know the time. The hour has come. And he builds into this uh, metaphor of talking of waking from sleeping. Paul, he goes, and he goes from this being excited to wake up and to go forth because salvation is nearer now than it was back then. And again, in this metaphor of, of waking up, again, we have to remember that back in the first century, the only light they would have had artificially would have been candlelights or torches or anything like that. So once night fell, everyone went to sleep. Everyone just went down. You couldn't do anything because you couldn't see anything. And so Paul is saying, the time has come, dawn is here, it's time to wake up, it's time to work, it's time to go forth and put into action what God has called you to. And he's saying again that it's exciting for us to do this because salvation is here, it's closer today than it was yesterday, it's closer now than when we first believed. And on first reading through this, it's easy to kind of think like, well, Paul must be saying that our salvation is ahead of us, right? That we are saved in the future. But that's, again, not theologically what we're talking about here. Like once you put your faith in Christ, you are saved in that very moment. But what he's talking about is the minute this day passes, the return of Christ is one day closer. Right? That we know that if you look towards Revelation, you know that Christ is coming again. He will return to this world. And when he does... All things come to an end. All death, all sin, all things wrong come to an end. And we enter into eternal life with Christ. That's the whole point of why we put our faith in Jesus. And this expectant coming of Christ is what we are excited for. And I think this is best illustrated when we think of like a wedding. Right? Whether you're a part of the wedding party or whether you're the bride or the groom, either way, you, when, you, when you first get a guy, let's kind of take it from the bridesmaids to the groomsmen. When you're asked to be a part of this wedding, you're, you're super excited. You're like, this is awesome. I'm so glad that I can be part of your wedding. And then you remember that, like, well, this is going to be like nine months from now, a year from now, whatever it is. And then like, yeah, you're kind of excited about it, but you don't really think about it. You're not thinking about it like, what am I supposed to do? You're not thinking about, you know, all the things that will happen on that particular day. You're just like, well, that's so far out. I don't have to worry about that. But as the days get closer, you get more excited. You start realizing, like, oh, i got to go get fitted for whether my suit or for my dress. You start recognizing there are things that you're going to have to do. Maybe there's some preparations you're going to have to help with. Maybe it's helping to design the bouquets. Maybe it's going out and taking the bachelor out or the bridesmaid out or whatever. You start getting more excited because more things start to happen. And as the wedding day comes closer and closer and closer, again, the bride and the groom are more and more excited for this to come together. They're excited to be joined together in marriage. And this is the whole idea that, again, Christ is bringing forth to us. So when Christ returns, we are his bride and he is the groom. We are excited and we are excitedly waiting for this day to come forth where we can be reunited in holy matrimony, essentially, with Christ Jesus, where we can be reunited with God forever. And this is brought together and kind of finished for us here in verse 12. As Paul talks about, and he continues that the night is far gone, that the day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and let's put on this armor of light. That since the day is here, we should not do things that happen in the dark, that we should do things in the light. And he talks about putting on this armor. And again, you can go through a whole section in Ephesians where we talk about the armor of God. But again, that's a whole other sermon that I want to get into. What I want to dive into, what I think we, we push into here is understanding what it means to cast off the works of darkness. Right? And this idea of casting off these works of darkness and putting on this armor, there's, there's meaning behind this casting off of, of defensiveness, of, of being ready to, to stand against the darkness. And again, you make sense of all this when you think of armor, because armor's always used in defense, right? You never see somebody attacking somebody with an armor piece, like at least not intentionally. If it happens, you're just kind of spur of the moment, I gotta hit you with something. But usually, you see armor as something to defend yourself with. And that's particularly, again, why you always see people putting on armor, because you don't attack somebody, you don't keep it mobile, you put on the armor so that you can defend yourself from the things that come at you. The other thing that you notice with armor is the condition that it's in. Right, that if you have armor on and it's shiny, it's polished, it looks brand new, it generally means, again, either A, you're brand new, or B, you're not defending. If your armor looks perfect, that means, again, you haven't been doing anything to defend or you're brand new to Christianity, if you're brand new to what Christ has called you to. 
And so as followers of Christ, as people who are called to, again, change the way that we live, to, to put off, to cast off the works of the darkness, and to enter into this walk with Christ in the light, it means that we will have dings and chips in us. It means that we'll have marks and scratches in us because the devil is coming after us. The devil is constantly calling us away from doing the things that Christ has called us to. He's calling us to, again, continue to live for ourselves and continue to live in a way that glorifies us rather than God. So the more that we push against that, the more things we have hit us and the more things that show that we are living for Christ, the more marks in our armor, the more we show how much we've stood in defense of what Christ has called us to. And Paul will get into this in a little more in our last point here. So let me go and read. We're going to be in verse 13 and 14 here. And he says, Let us walk properly as in the daytime, not in the orgies and drunkenness, not in the sexual immorality and the sensuality, not in the quarrelings and the jealousies, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. I think the last thing that we learn from what Paul has taught us here is that we are to put on Christ. We are to leave behind again the things of the darkness. We are to cast them off and we are to walk in Christ instead. See, he wrote in verse 13, excuse me, Paul continues kind of this idea of again putting off the darkness. And he starts giving examples of again this old lifestyle that we lived in. And he says again, the morning has come. We should walk in the morning, we should be in the light. Paul gives us, again, three examples, and he gives them in, in, in kind of couples of different lifestyles that we should no longer participate in. He talks of living in orgies and drunkenness. This is kind of that life of partying and reckless living. And he talks of living in sexual immorality and sensuality. This is a life, again, seeking personal pleasures outside the marriage constructs that God has given to us. And he talks about not living in quarreling and jealousy. He's talking about that we should live lives not focused on ourselves, but instead continue to focus everything that we have on others, on the needs of others, on on what the others bring to us, regardless of what happens to us. These lifestyles are opposite to what somebody walking with Christ normally do. Right? We should not be doing these orgies and drunkenness. We should not be living in sexual immorality. We should not be quarreling with others and living jealously. Instead, we are to cast those things off and walk properly in the light. And then finally, in verse 14, Paul tells us that we are to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. We are to leave no room for these lifestyles in darkness. We're to leave no provisions for the flesh. We're to leave no room to possibly even gratify the evil desires that may come. And I think for this to make sense, I think the best way to kind of think of this is is with our jobs, with our schools, whatever it may be. For a lot of us, maybe not all of us, but a lot of us, we have uniforms. Right? When you go to work, you're required to wear something in particular. Yeah, maybe you're working at Walmart and you've got to wear one of those blue vests with the little yellow sun, I think is what it is. If you're at Home Depot, you've got to put on one of the orange aprons. If you're at Target, you're going to have a red polo. If you're in one of these places as a shopper, if as a customer, you're looking for help, you're looking for somebody in one of these uniforms. You're looking for somebody wearing this particular garment so that you know that's the person I'm going to. And so what Paul is telling us here, if we work for Christ... If we are putting on this armor of Christ, what does that look like? What does that look like for us to live in a way that shows others the uniform that we have on? What uniform are we wearing when we interact with people, when we are looking to show people hope? When people are looking for hope, do they turn to you? Do they see you in the uniform that Christ has called you to? Because if we live in the darkness, as what Paul was telling us here, in these orgies and drunkenness and sexual immoralities and sensualities and quarrelings and jealousies, if we live in these things that we see in verse 13, when people are looking for hope, they won't look to you. They'll look to everybody else aside from you. And so Paul is telling us that if we are to live in Christ, if we are to live in a way that glorifies Christ, if we are to be living sacrifices for Christ, then we are to wear his uniform. We are to put on Christ himself. That we are to be different because Christ has called us to be different. It doesn't mean that we can't achieve success. It doesn't mean that we can't enjoy life. But it means that we live in a way that we strive to help others see Christ before we see our own glory first. That we strive again to be living sacrifices for him before we live for ourselves first. And so ultimately when looking at and living like Christ, I think the question is going to be asking, who is my neighbor? Like, won't you be my neighbor? Right? Instead of saying, who is my neighbor? Like the lawyer said, I think we need to be asking, like, won't you be my neighbor? Because when you ask the question, who is my neighbor? That limits things down. That shrinks down the population. 
right? When you say, like, who is my neighbor? Is it this group of people here? Do I need to include those people over there? Do I need to talk about this, my family members? Who, who, like, who is my neighbor? Who do I need to include? But if you start asking the question, won't you be my neighbor? You start saying, like, who can I include with my family? Who can I include in this family of Christ? Do those people get to be my neighbor? Do those people get to be my neighbor? Won't you be my neighbor is inviting, whereas who will be my neighbor is excluding. And I think that's what Christ has called us to. In John's first letter, he wrote that we love because Christ first loved us. That Jesus' love for us is so great that it overflows on us, that we owe a debt to it, that we have so much love and surplus that we need to give it away to as many people as we possibly can. That's why we have a debt, because we have so much of it, we have to give it away. And so the question at the end of the day is, is who's your one? Who's the one that you can be focusing on that you can give Christ's love to? And in this idea, this uh, uh, question of who is the one, this is going to be a campaign that we're going to start maybe next week, the week after, depending on how things go. But we want to start pushing this idea of who's your one as we lead in towards Easter. That we want to be thinking about who can be the one person that we can invite to Easter service, they can hear about what Christ has done. Who's not necessarily the whole world. I don't need to think about all the people of the world, but I can think at least of one person. Who is one person that I can think of in my life that needs to hear the gospel? Who is one person that I can spend the next few weeks on telling them of what Christ has done, of what my church is like, of how they would love to be part of my church, of how we can continue to glorify Christ together here in this church. Who's one person that I can focus on to hear the gospel? And when we work together with our leadership team, we want to make Easter Sunday a day that we celebrate the risen Christ, but a day that we can celebrate hopefully many people being here through food, through activities, Whatever it is that we want to come up with, however it is that we want to continue to celebrate people being here, to celebrate the glory of Christ being brought back to earth. And so again, if you've placed your faith in Christ, then my question to you this morning is, again, who's going to be your one? Start thinking about it now. Start planning now. Who can be that one person you can reach out to? But if you're sitting here, if you're joining us, if you're watching online and you haven't accepted Christ, then I think the question you first have to ask, or you ask yourself is, like, why isn't Jesus your one? Like, why have you not placed your faith in Jesus? Because you've been brought here to this place, you've clicked on this link, you've done whatever it is to, to be here in this place. And we're telling you right now that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. And then he went to the cross and died for your sins, for my sins, for all of our sins. So that in you simply placing your faith in him, you would have eternal life. That's what's on the table. That's what he's offering to you right now. And so the question at last, again, who is your one? Why isn't Jesus your one? And again, if you've made that decision, if this is something that you want to learn more about, if you have questions, again, Jesus invited questions. Jesus invited conversations. He wanted to know you. He wanted to care for you. He wanted to love on you. And so if you have questions, if you want to have a conversation, I'll be down here in the front here in a second. Our praise team will come up and they'll lead us in a song in response. And again, we'd love to engage with you in that way. Again, if you're joining us online, our email is in the description. We'd love to connect with you. And I promise somebody will get back to you today. But again, we want to continue to share what Christ has done in our lives, of how we can continue to share the love of Christ in your life. Because again, we all owe a debt to love. We all owe a debt to Christ. And we are trying to not work for our salvation, but continue to share that love because we have so much of it because of what Christ has done for us. And so our goal is, again, is to wake up, is to leave behind the things of the darkness, is to continue to stop asking, who is my neighbor, and continue to ask, won't you be my neighbor? And so I hope and I pray that that's the question that you ask here this morning. Won't you be my neighbor? Who is it that can I love? Who is it that I can continue to share the gospel with? Who is it that needs to hear the gospel this morning, this week, this month? So with that, let me pray for us as we close. Father, we thank you, we love you, we continue to glorify you in all that you do for us. Of the grace that you've given to us, that you've bestowed upon us, and sending Christ to die on the cross for us. And so, Father, would you continue to allow us to seek your face, to continue to seek your heart, that as we grow in our affections for you, that you would, again, continue to allow us to grow in our call to those around us, and that again, we would eventually see ourselves being called to the world 
but we just want to continue to share your love with everyone around us. And so, Father, again, would you make that our passion? Would you continue to make that the mission of our hearts? And again, would you let us just continue to grow in your love as we share that love with those around us? So, God, we thank you. We continue to praise you. We continue to lean upon you. And we continue to glorify you. We do these all, and we pray these all in Jesus' name. Amen.